The Full Melt Show is intended for a mature audience. It contains adult themes, adult content, and sometimes adult language. Listener discretion is advised. The Full Melt. All right, so on an everyday occasion, I would just uh, play some audio here uh, from uh, television or, or something that happened in the news or something that's happening uh, currently. In this instance, I wanted to reach back a little bit in history and talk today about cannabis as medicine before it was prohibited. Because I want you to have a clear view of what that was and what it looked like. Now, today in history, President Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater. And just prior to that, some six days before that, on April 9th, that's when Lee surrenders uh, to Grant at Appomattox. And the reason I wanted to bring all this up, because if you look back in Civil War history, uh, you'll see that the doctor's bag was full of a lot of different stuff. It was a different day. It was a different era. And the difference between then and now is separated by the Food and Drug Administration. And preceding just before that, a, a different act about food and drugs. It, it kind of preceded the FDA. And this all eventually leads up to the scheduling of narcotics. And then the war on drugs. So historically, because of the assassination today of President Lincoln, I wanted to play you this little piece from uh, the Smithsonian and uh, the History Channel. It's just a short little piece about what this battlefield looked like. Was there cannabis medicine in there? Who was down there helping these people? Check it out. General Stonewall Jackson, Confederate Civil War soldier, shot by his own men, died eight days later, but not directly of those gunshot wounds. Stonewall Jackson was a victim of friendly fire, which is kind of ironic because he was in fact very much beloved by his men. General Jackson was shot actually three times. He was shot twice in the left arm and once in the right hand. The bullet that struck the arm above the elbow completely shattered his humerus. The first thing they do is give him a bottle of whiskey, he takes a big swig of it. That's about the dumbest thing that you can do. You'd have to drink enough alcohol to be just about comatose before it's going to work as an anesthetic. But by the time it did that, it's lowered your blood pressure to the point where you're probably going to bleed to death. His physicians examine him. They determine there's no way they're going to be able to save the arm. They took General Jackson. They chloroformed him a little too much, and you could become so profoundly unconscious that you stop breathing. Too little chloroform, and you could wake up in the middle of somebody sawing your arm off. The saw was laid onto the limb, sawing through the skin, the muscle, the connective tissue, and then the bone. He wakes up from the surgery, and he does surprisingly well. He has conversations with his aides. He corresponds back and forth with some other generals. Around day four, things take a dramatic turn for the worse. He develops fever. He begins to slip in and out of consciousness. And Stonewall Jackson actually died of pneumonia. He didn't directly die of his injuries, of the gunshot wounds. And he didn't directly die of the amputation. Pneumonia, as a consequence of an amputation during the Civil War, was quite common. Again, it was very difficult for the physician applying the chloroform to determine just how much the patient was getting. So inhaling one's saliva, one's stomach content was a constant risk. And if you did inhale some of your stomach contents, particularly if somebody gave you, let's say, whiskey right before they operated on you, you very possibly might develop a pneumonia as a consequence of this operation. Here we are in the medical sciences collections at the Smithsonian, and we've pulled out a number of objects that we have that are related to Civil War medicine. Most of which are fairly disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I have two three times great grandfathers named Elijah who fought for the Union cause during the Civil War, and Elijah Hensley in particular had a battlefield amputation, circular saw method at the Battle of Saltville, Virginia. So. Okay. Let me steal my stomach and show sure. me what you've got. Okay. Well, I guess one of the things we want to remember and sort of emphasize about the Civil War is that they did have anesthesia. Isn't that a relief There's, to know? Yes. So it's very likely that your ancestor did have anesthesia Phew. for the operation. 
uh, we have a little bottle here that is tincture of opium. Opium, yeah. Opium. So they had opium. They had uh, morphine also. They had hypodermic syringes, so they could actually inject morphine. But they definitely used a lot of opium. Very good pain reliever. And the all-important... That's right. 24 ounces <laughs> of whiskey were kept in this little case. Your ancestor, who actually had an amputation, was probably taken back to a field hospital. Stomach wounds usually meant death, but a bullet to an arm or a leg was survivable. All right, there you go, sir. Breathe deep. Deep. These are the types of instruments that would have been used to perform the amputation. Ooh, there's the saw. There's the oh, saw. Right. Wow. They didn't really know about germs, as we think of germs today. A quarter of the amputees didn't make it because of the infection that set in afterwards. Some surgeons lacked training or were learning on the job. I think the average soldier was probably very suspicious of the doctor. Are you high? I what are you high. talking about? This is the full meltdown. The Full Melt Show, a marijuana discussion about news, culture, politics, and lifestyle. Fullmelt.com. Toll free, 844-420-TALK. 844-420-TALK. Hey, it happened today at Ford Theater. President Lincoln's assassinated some six days after the Civil War ends. That's how. That's what. That's what the chronology was. You know, uh, I remember all this stuff, but I didn't remember some of the detail of the chronology of how this stuff happened. So I'm fascinated by the idea that the Civil War ends on May 9th. I'm sorry, April 9th. Uh, that's when the surrender happens. That's when the formal surrender happens. Uh, the war's over then. It's really not. There's a lot of battles that take place afterwards. Lincoln gets assassinated six days later. And if you look at the history of it, they're not even they don't even end up adopting the 13th Amendment that frees slaves across the board. It prohibits slavery until December 18th of the same year. So, uh, yeah, this is this is 1865. And in that day and time. This is, of course, pre-prohibition uh, by some number of years. Uh, by nearly half a decade. Uh, but the, the the way that doctors looked at medicine was very, very different. I mean, Louis Pasteur hadn't done his experiments, and they, they didn't understand about uh, the microbiology that could get in there and really infect you and, and make you very ill, aside from the fact that you've just had a limb blown off. Uh, so medicine was very different. But I think it's interesting, given the historical significance of the, the week, because this is the week that the Civil War ended. Uh, that's a major th event in U.S. history. It's the bloodiest battle we've ever seen. Uh, there was a lot of American blood spilled there. And the uh, aftershock, the ringing in the ears from this war exists still here today. And... The reason that I bring all of this to your attention now is because it still underpins the war on drugs, which was very much so uh, driven much by hatred, bigotry. Uh, the very word marijuana is a pejorative word. It's not what people referred to as cannabis back then. They talked about uh, this substance as cannabis. They didn't understand the word marijuana. It was introduced by prohibitionists because it was uh, a slang term coming from Mexico. Marijuana. Oh, no. no what's that? Uh, to get those foreigners coming in. Uh, they're dangerous. Well, we don't like them. We're afraid of them. It's easy to hate what you're afraid of. It's easy to be afraid of what you don't understand. And this is part of what underpins the drug war. So I wanted to bring to your attention where kind of the history of this kind of it precedes this prohibition on drugs. Uh, when you talk about cannabis being used as medicine, uh, this was in every doctor's bags, a tincture, uh, an ointment, 
a remedy of some sort. And so the question today is, did they use cannabis as medicine during the Civil War? I would venture to say that the answer is yes, because for some hundred years preceding, you know, the war on drugs or the prohibition of cannabis, this was used in, in, in every doctor's bag that came visiting. There were a lot of visiting doctors back then. People didn't have a way around a lot. Now, people were poor, a very rural. Doctor would come and visit because there weren't many doctors. So they'd have to come from out of town sometimes. And this is a remedy that was in all of these doctor's bags, tinctures and ointments and uh, other things. Did that make its way to the battlefield in the Civil War? Uh, this was a gruesome, bloody awful place uh, with implements of war that are shocking if you look at it and uh, i think um you'll be pleased to hear that uh, coming up after the break uh, we're lucky enough to have on an individual who uh, has some rather fame noted historian and curator of the clark county museum in henderson nevada you'll know him from the history channel's pawn stars uh mr mark Patton hall will be on the program in just moments, coming up after the break. And perhaps uh, he can give you a, a historical account of what happened there, uh, what was going on. Uh, were we using cannabis as medicine in the battlefield back then, as rough and tumble as it was? I mean, I think this is a valid question. He'd be a good person to get an answer from. Uh, some people would say that the bloodiest war was the war on drugs. I don't, it's, it's probably, uh, maybe that is true, uh, but it's not a, 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 the blood that we see. You know, if you were around back during the Civil War, you would see a lot of blood from the war in person. On clothing, coming into homes, people taking care of the wounded, uh, whether or not they were from the North or the South. It was a very different day and age. People treated people very differently, even with this divide, this racial divide amongst the, the Union and the Confederacy. And so there's this uh, article that was uh, published in uh, MarijuanaPatients.org, published an article, and I'll read you a bit from it. One of them quoting General, General Ulysses S. Grant saying, it, it is of great value to the wounded and feeble, and that it's harmless. I've got another quote that I'll read after the break when we bring on uh, Mark Patton Hall, and we'll talk about cannabis as medicine before it was prohibited. You're getting the full melt show right now. You're getting the full melt. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit canalock.com to learn more about no smell technology. They're parasites. They've got no contribution to this society. They're preying on our community and our kids. It's going to end badly. We've got exactly $100,000 in cash in the back of this car. I bet there's guys right there in that prison for doing just what we're about to do. The Breckenridge Cannabis Club to be a household name. This is us pioneering a new industry. He's going after every resort town in Colorado. His plan is brilliant. This is a big boy operation now. We are not the Amsterdam of the Rockies. We're Breckenridge. Absolutely unbelievable to us that this has happened so quickly. That's when the town erupted. All hell can break loose. I think we have an image to protect. The powerful Ooh. elite has definitely put the pressure on. Everyone is playing everyone. They're going to have a target painted on their back. That is a real threat. There's $2 billion to be had next year. I plan to take more than my fair share. High Profits. Season premieres Sunday night at 10 Eastern on CNN. Does your dog or cat suffer with joint disorders, arthritis, anxiety, cancer, chronic pain, or other ailments? Hemp or cannabis-based medicinal products are now legal. Why should your pets go without the same options that we have available? Try Satibis, a daily hemp oil with CBD. Satibis is quality inspected and made in the USA. Easy to use drops are applied directly to your pet's food. For your pet's wellness, try Satibis Drops. 
Ask for Satidas at your local pet store or learn more at PetPain.com. You know, it's not easy out there, but it can be easier. And when it comes to medical marijuana in Michigan and chronic pain management, Dr. Bob Townsend, renowned for his patient advocacy and deep understanding of how patients and medical marijuana certifications fit together, makes it his hallmark to educate and provide the best holistic treatment for your condition. His knowledgeable staff makes you feel warm and welcome, and Dr. Bob makes you feel well. With locations across the state in Cadillac and Gaylord, Kalamazoo, Marquette, Mount Pleasant, Muskegon, Saginaw, Traverse City, you can't beat the convenience and feeling you get knowing you have someone on your side that cares denali healthcare is on the web at denalihealthcaremi.com get answers to your holistic health questions or schedule an appointment now by calling 989-339-4464 chronic pain management and holistic health answers is what they do it's all they do denalihealthcaremi.com get your certification and peace of mind now by making an appointment with dr bob townsend at 989-339-4464 With this warmer weather, I get more active. Headaches and pains keep me from doing things I enjoy, like golfing and working outside my yard. Toledo Hemp Center's new location, 1415 Sylvania Avenue, has shown me there is an alternative to pharmaceutical drugs. I use CBD, cannabidiol, infused hemp lotions, oral sprays, and topical oils. Thank you, Toledo Hemp Center, for helping me restore and maintain my health with no side effects and no high. Find out more at Toledo Hemp Center.com. So this is Brian Rogers and Caitlin McGuire from CNN's High Profit. And you're listening to the Full Melt Show. Call me if you don't come at all. You leave your peace in on that's your call. Okay, so I brought to you the idea that uh, this is the week in history uh, that the Civil War ended. Uh, bloodiest war, I would argue, that ever happened uh, to, to the people in the, this country. And it, it was our own people. We were spilling our own blood. It wasn't a foreign invader. Uh, but I'm not the expert on this subject. Um, I'd like to welcome to the program Mark Patton Hall. Uh, you'd know him from History's Pawn Stars. Uh, Mr. Hall, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. And it's Hall Patton, actually. Hall Patton. You know, I don't know. I, I keep screwing that up. It's a ba- you know, I, I apologize. That, that's not all right. You dump, you dump a hyphen in a name. It, it happens. <laughs> Listen, um, we were talking about uh, the Civil War ending today and uh, – the significance of what that meant, because it gets lost in the history of just uh, the argument between the Union and the Confederacy. Um, people don't understand sometimes really what this looked like and how significant this impacted the country. Uh, can you kind of give us an overview of what was going on there and how bloody this really was? Oh, yes. Well, I think I think in terms of the war itself, what we tend to forget is is the Civil War really defined what the United States was going to be. It, it it ended some of the arguments that had been happening in terms of what we were going to be as a nation that had started back during the revolution, you know, whether or not we were going to be a slaveholding country, whether or not um, uh, federal law overrode state law, issues like this. Those were all things that came up in the war. But the fact that it was a civil war, the fact that we were fighting ourselves, it was literally at times brother against brother, and we were fighting in, at a time when we had new technologies for killing and maiming people, and yet we still weren't real clear on how to use them. These were brutal so, technologies, weren't they? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, we were, we were using a new bullet. It was called a mini ball, even though it wasn't a ball. We think of a ball as being round. A mini ball looked like a bullet, but it was a, a heavy, soft lead slug with a, an indent on the bottom of it, so it could easily be loaded into a muzzle loader, and as it fired, that indent expanded just enough to catch the grooves on the barrel, so it was spinning, it was much more accurate, and because it was soft lead, if it hit something like a body, it would spray. So it would not only take out a chunk of bone or, or uh, you know, it would, it would maim as well as kill, uh, but it would also tend to hurt other parts of the body at the same time. And we were using this while still doing massed charges up hillsides in that and hoping to break the other line. You know, some of the most bloody battles we had were ones uh, where you were, you were actually sending waves of men against entrenched positions where, un- unless 
something really bad happened in the entrenched position, they ran out of ammo or something, they were going to win, and you were just mowing down uh, your people. Um, what did uh, people use to counter these things? Uh, if you were injured or wounded, uh, you were obviously, if somebody could they'd drag you off the battlefield, I would imagine. Uh, what happened to them yep. after that? Were, how are they cared for, or were they? Well, one of the one of the interesting things was the the idea of nursing got its start in the Crimean War, which was just before the Civil War, and so that had come to the United States. So we had not only trained uh, surgeons and doctors; there were a lot of hospitals created. There was a lot of civilian effort on this behalf as well through the uh, Sanitary Commission and the Christian Commission and groups like this that raised money and. Uh, outfitted hospitals and all of that, and, and a number of other things as well. But for the actual men that were on the battlefield, what happened in the Civil War was this is the first time that we had field dressing stations. Think, think MASH, you know, the old MASH television show with the idea of a forward hospital that you brought people to. Well, the, the origin of that idea of caring for, for wounded soldiers was what were called field dressing stations. So you were taken from the battlefield to a very close by place where you were looked at by doctors and they tried to do as much as they could. Of course, this was also a time when we didn't understand about germs. We didn't understand about uh, cleanliness. You know, the doctors would be working and they'd be dripping blood and, and working with bloody instruments and that sort of thing from one person to the next. You know, they might rinse them off, but it was in a bucket of water that you never changed. And so oh. you, you saw that a lot of people, they, they ended up surviving the war, uh, but I think <laughs> to a great extent because they were tough, you know, because there wasn't, there. It, it, you had ether to put somebody out, but not a lot of it. And ether is a very, uh, very volatile substance. It burns very quickly, so you can't use it in all cases. And it's very easy to uh, kill people with as well. Stop your so heart. It, it, there was a, just a lot of it where they just did it. You know, if you had, if, you, if it had to be a an amputation, for example, there were surgeons who were specially trained to be able to amputate a leg or an arm or a finger or whatever in a very short amount of time. And you just went under the knife and they chopped it off and you moved on. They were called operators. And that was, they were the best of the best. They were the best surgeons out there. So they had further training so that it could minimize the time that you were under the knife. Uh, were, uh, what are people doing for pain? Was there any pain relief? Was it just uh, giving them the alcohol? There was a little piece from the Smithsonian that I played uh, where they had a field kit from the, uh, the Army. And mm -hmm. in there was a big 24-ounce canister that was supposed to be filled with whiskey. Um, was, oh, yeah. this, was this how they dealt with uh, pain issues? Well, whiskey, uh, a lot of opium was used, laudanum. Um, uh, they, they, they did have some uh, chemicals like that. In fact, a number of people became addicted to, to opium because of uh, pain in the war and, and recovering from it. But to a great extent, you just recovered. There wasn't much you could do. Were they using, um, were they using things like cannabis extracts, this kind of thing, hemp, hemp treatments? No, not not in any of the actual medical uh, work. Cannabis, the the the, the cannabis ex extract that that became known after the war was normally used in snake oils, in in patent medicine. They weren't being used in actual uh, 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 how would you say in, uh, in medical practice. Uh, me yeah, medical practice. Even though it was listed in the uh, Materia Medica. Um, I believe starting in the 1850s, but that was the the uh, oils. It wasn't it wasn't uh, cannabis or, or marijuana as we think of it today. At at that point, what what they had was hemp, and and hemp was grown not for any use other than to make clothing, to make rope. I mean that's why you had it. I mean we were growing um, hemp in the in the in the United States or what became the United States in the 17th century. But it was it was a it was a crop in order to make things out of it because it's it's a high fiber crop it's a good sure. crop for it's making a, rope from good durable goods 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've got a quote from a, an article that uh, quotes Confederate General Robert E. Lee uh, declaring, I wish it was in my power to place it, cannabis, in the pocket of every soldier because I'm convinced that it speedily relieves debility, fatigue, and suffering. <laughs> Sorry for laughing, but that's that's a fake. That, that never happened. That quote was is not real. Um, and you will find it out there. It's, it's amazing how many websites have picked it up. There's uh, some similar quote that they picked up that supposedly is uh, one from U.S. Grant, and neither one of them had any idea of what to do with with cannabis. That, that this... wasn't on their their horizon. They they would not only would not have said it, they couldn't have said it. They wouldn't have had any idea to say it. This argument uh, um, uh, in this article uh, refers to that quote from Grant that you just referred to, uh, saying it's of great value to the wounded and feeble and that it is harmless, it refers to it possibly referring to opium that was being used and frequently abused during that period of time in history and still is today. Well, yeah, but that's not real. It's it's a fake quote. It is a fake quote. Yeah, it is. It, it, they never said that. Neither one of them said that. It's like there's there's also one out there that, that claims that um, um, oh shoot Benjamin Franklin uh, said something like that and he didn't. You know <laughs> it, it that those people have made up those quotes and because they sound good and fit the narrative that they want they keep using them. That's unfortunate in my mind. Um, well, it kind I of bastard- have history be correct. It kind of bastardizes history in that instance, doesn't and it? Very much so. And, uh, well, I'm glad you were able to. It gets repeated all the time. It's sort of like the the uh, if you've ever seen the uh, story, Brother Eagle, Sister Sky, that supposedly Chief Seattle talking, you know, about uh, the the glories of nature and all that sort of thing. It's a made up story. A, an English teacher wrote it, you know, back in the 1960s. <laughs> you know, but we when when you get quotes like that being used over and over again. And unfortunately, today it's, it's used on the Internet. And as much as I like the Internet, it's a terrible place for doing research if you don't understand how to vet the information you that gotta, you're looking at. Yeah, you definitely have to properly source it. I, I frequently get in arguments with people on Facebook that end up uh, posting uh, the uh, uh, you know underpinnings of what their argument is uh, based on what is really, if you go look at it, a satire post on, a, <laughs> on some weird website. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, in in my role as as a museum administrator and and as an historian, um, you know, part of part of what it is my job to do is to make sure that if I'm using information, it's coming from a par- properly vetted source. So you've heard you those know? expressions before about Lee and and uh... I, I actually have. Yes, I've I've dealt with. Uh, because of some work I've done on on the Pawn Stars show and and some exhibits I've done in the past, I've I've dealt with uh, uh, medicine in in the Civil War, and uh, they they show up. But it's it, in fact the first time I ran into them, I did a, a, quite a, a search to try to figure out where they came from and realized that they didn't exist because <laughs> they didn't make sense to me. You know, and there's a there's a number of times. When if something looks way too good to be true, it probably isn't, and unfortunately, that's what these these quotes are. Real quick uh, on that on that Pawn Star show, what's the thing that took you the longest to kind of research and figure out and authenticate or or debunk? <laughs> the the worst one that they had me look at was the Soviet ICBM launch keys, because the Soviet Union was not really big on telling us how they were going to destroy us and didn't publish anything and as it worked out it was the it was actually the only one that i know of that i really got wrong because i said that they were soviet rocket launch keys and they were soviet icbm launch keys the difference by the way if you ever get offered one is lay it down on a flat surface if the prong is horizontal to the surface or parallel to the surface it's an icbm launch key if it stands straight up it's a rocket launch key and how long did that take you to figure out? Well, I, I said it was a rocket launch key, and that was based on finding the original city flag for the community of Leninsk, which is today Baikonur in Georgia, um, and that their city flag used the design. It, it finally, I, I ended up connecting with the fellow who bought the only five sets of those keys to come out of the Soviet Union and working with him and the information that he had and checking his background in that, 
I was able to find out, okay, this is what the difference is between them. But it took some time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, and that one, when I did the initial research, it probably took two weeks to try to track it down. Um, and uh, later on, uh, it probably was another six months before I finally had enough to say, okay, this is what I should have said. I should have said, yes, they're ICBM launch keys, not rocket launch keys, <laughs> because there is that little difference. You can't intermingle them. Uh, because, you know, they didn't want somebody who was being allowed to launch a rocket to be able to go in and launch an ICBM. Uh, was Rick back at the office tapping his fingers on the desk waiting? He's like, what is going on? No, no, <laughs> no, no. We, we, because what I do for a living is run three museums for Clark County, Nevada. That's a lot. Um, we, we do have to schedule when I show up there. You know, what he says, let me call my friend, <laughs> you know. You can call me, but but it's got to fit my schedule as well. It might be a while before I get there, in other words. That's right, yeah. And, and you know, you can imagine it would be a really boring show if you have to wait three days for the end of the show. <laughs> so they kind of truncate that part of it a bit. Uh, Mr. Mark Hall Patton, I know that, uh, and I got it right that time, right, Mark Hall Patton? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, know, I, I know you're a busy guy and you've got some other stuff to do. I always ask this of our guests when they come on the show. Would you be willing to give us a line or would you be willing to say, hey, this is Mark Hall Patton from uh, History Channel's Pawn Stars and you're listening to the Full Melt Show? Um, I will, but I can't say History Channel's okay. uh, Pawn Stars. We'll just do, do but, Mark Hall Patton then. Yes. Hey, this is Mark Hall Patton and you're listening to the Full Melt Show. Thank you so much for coming on the program today and straightening us out on this issue over uh, whether Grant said this or, uh, you know, somebody else said that about what, uh, you know, the history of this was. Because, uh, boy, it's important that we get it right, isn't it? I think so. And I, and I appreciate having the chance to do that. If you run into anything else, please feel free to call me back. I definitely will. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Uh, what an interesting thing. What a bloody place that was. And reflecting back on it, you know, I've got some other information that we'll talk about after the break. It's coming up here very shortly. Um, I'm surprised about those quotes, though, because I've seen them elsewhere, too, not just in the article that I'm reading here um, online. And, and, you know, that's what's confusing about some of this misinformation or disinformation. Uh, somebody wrote that somewhere to fit their needs. And it got repeated and repeated and repeated enough that people started to believe it and sourced it as fact. But it's, it's nice that we've got real historians, uh, people who research this stuff and look at it. Uh, cannabis was being used as medicine during this time period. It just wasn't making it to the battlefield. Uh, there were a lot of uh, nuns out there running out and taking care of people from the north and the south. So we'll talk about the patent medicines and cannabis as medicine during the Civil War, coming up after the break. Stand by. You're getting the bull melt. It started with Weed 1. Some have called it a watershed moment. Then came Weed 2. It's absurd that we would have to do this to get medicine. Now Dr. Sanjay Gupta is at it again, and he's reaching higher than ever with Weed 3. I never thought I would be smoking weed in the hospital. The movement behind it. We demand this plant go through the process of the FDA. The radical research. I have to say I'm kind of stunned. Weed 3, the marijuana revolution. All new Sunday, April 19th at 9. Hey, it's Steve Green. Make sure you make it out for the Big 420 celebration at the Sweet Leaf Patient Care Center in Flint. It's going to be a huge celebration from 11 to 7 Sunday and Monday. Holistic medicines and teas are just a part of it. There's massage, food, honey and lavender healing products, local musicians and artists, workshops and seminars, vendors and people galore. It's the Sweet Leaf Patient Care Collective, 400 South Door Highway, Flint, Sunday and Monday. That's this Sunday and Monday from 11 to 7 for 420. Don't miss it. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit canalock.com to learn more about no smell technology.
With this warmer weather, I get more active. Headaches and pains keep me from doing things I enjoy, like golfing and working outside my yard. Toledo Hemp Center's new location, 1415 Sylvania Avenue, has shown me there is an alternative to pharmaceutical drugs. I use CBD, cannabidiol, infused hemp lotions, oral sprays, and topical oils. Thank you, Toledo Hemp Center, for helping me restore and maintain my health with no side effects and no high. Find out more at ToledoHempCenter.com. Does your dog or cat suffer with joint disorders, arthritis, anxiety, cancer, chronic pain, or other ailments? Hemp or cannabis-based medicinal products are now legal. Why should your pets go without the same options that we have available? Try Satibis, a daily hemp oil with CBD. Satibis is quality inspected and made in the USA. Easy to use drops are applied directly to your pet's food. For your pet's wellness, try Satibis Drops. Ask for Satibus at your local pet store or learn more at PetPain.com. It's the Bull Melt Radio Show. Radio Show. So if you get a chance at the top of the page right there at the fullmelt.com, there's a button for uh, Facebook. Please like us on Facebook, and there's also a button for Twitter, and uh, follow us on Twitter. If you get a chance, click through the Spreaker website, whether you're listening to the show live or you're whether you're listening after we're off the air as a podcast. Uh, click through the Spreaker site and, and follow us there. Like us there. Because once I get to 150 uh, likes over there, I'm going to submit the program to iHeartRadio. And so maybe we can get picked up by iHeart, and that would be another convenient way for people to get the program. And, and an awesome way, by the way. Uh, so we were talking before uh, when we had the guy from the Pawn Star show on, uh, Mark Hall Patton. And uh, he was talking about what the battlefield looked like because uh, this is the week that uh, the Civil War ended. Uh, Lincoln got shot today. And, you know, he kind of dispelled some myths and underscored what the battlefield looked like. And I just want to tell you there's this really interesting book called AntiqueCannabisBook.com. Uh, it, it, it's, it's the Antique Cannabis Book, but you can find it at AntiqueCannabisBook.com. And it, it lists all of this information historically about um, the kinds of medicines that were used pre-prohibition. And so they talk about I think there's pictures of stuff. There's all these awesome pictures of these different patent medicines. Uh, tinctures, fluid extracts, uh, you know, the history of these tinctures, uh, cannabis tinctures and their uses. Uh, the manufacturer, how they did those things. And uh, then the companies, the drug companies that were making these uh, patent medicines, because that's really, that's what they were back then. Uh, they, uh, they, if you've ever seen the, um, uh, what is that, uh, USP, uh, that's uh, because the, meta, it's meta, I always wonder what that was, USP. What's the USP? Because you see it on, you know, ointments and creams and stuff you get in the store. Something, something, USP. Well, the USP, I just discovered today, I didn't know it. But it's, uh, it means that it's been manufactured according to the U.S. Pharmacopoeia. Uh, it's, that's, that's the deal. USP, United States Pharmacopoeia. Uh, the, there's a method outlined in, in how to make these things. So some of these uh, companies, uh, you're going to recognize, I mean, this is a long time ago, but they're still around today. Now, this is one you won't know, probably. Uh, H.K. Mulford Laboratories. It's today now part of Merck. Abbott Laboratories. Park Davis and Company, today known as Pfizer. Eli Lilly and Company. Squibb and Sons. That's Bristol Myers Squibb now. William Merrill Chemical Company, today known as American Hoist. Say that right? Hoist? LL, or, I'm sorry, Lloyd Brothers. Today known as American Hoist also. Uh, John Wythe and uh, Brother Company. Today known as American Home Products. Merck and Company. Sharp and Dome. Today part of the Merck Company. Tilden and Company. The Upjohn Company. And Shifflin and Company. All these people made cannabis tinctures up until they were prohibited by the U.S. government. So uh, this book is kind of interesting uh, because it really goes into great detail uh, about 
the history of these patent medicines that included cannabis and hemp and their derivatives and their concentrates and the various forms of them. Uh, and this is a partial list of these companies. Uh, it says here that uh, I think the reader gets the idea, but uh, there were a lot of brand name pharmaceutical manufacturers out there. Um, uh, they go on to talk about from apothecary to brand name tinctures, uh, cases of cannabis poisoning, the myth. I mean, it's just some amazing information. And part of what people uh, see, if you look up uh, cannabis tincture on, if you Google it, you likely see a Park Davis bottle. That's what people see. That's what it's like the number one thing that pulls up when you Google that. Uh, there's a, a bottle by Park Davis. It's worth a lot if you find one today. Uh, for numerous reasons, it says the Park Davis cannabis fluid extract bottle has become the most famous and most sought after of all cannabis antique bottles. Literally the pride of any collection. In mint condition, it can command between $1,000 and $5,000. And well, it should, it literally represents the height of botanical medical, uh, I'm sorry, botanical medical technology in many ways. Uh, Park Davis, uh, what the label talks about. What's on there? <laughs> and it's funny because there's this, it says, notice uh, the clearly visible word poison. Uh, which, as explained elsewhere, is a misnomer. Despite the fact that no one has ever been known to die from its use, many states and government agencies still required that word to be placed on the label of cannabis tincture. Uh, this contradiction in terms sometimes leads to humorous situations. For instance, notice the lack of any mention of, and they're talking about the picture of the label, the lack of any mention of an antidote, which, by the way, is coffee on the label. Uh, one would expect a reputable pharmaceutical house like Park Davis, which even lists its manufacture date, to have listed an antidote for poison. But can one imagine such a label? Warning, poison. Number of people that die each year? Zero. Antidote? Coffee. <laughs> it's kind of humorous. But I think you may have found a home remedy uh, or a natural remedy for uh, those of you who've eaten too much medible. If you had a brownie and you went too far and you didn't realize it, which is a common thing for people who have not been exposed to edible forms of cannabis before. Uh, they hide it in a brownie and it doesn't taste so bad. It's because, you know, extracts of anything are going to taste very potent. Uh, go, go get some extract of mint. Put it on your tongue and see what you think. You're not going to like it very much. Just go get some extract of, you know, cocoa. Get some raw cocoa powder, put it on your tongue, see what you think. I don't think you're going to like it. Cinnamon. I mean, I could go on. Uh, this is a potent, pungent thing. So you put it in something sweet and tasty like a brownie, and it's not that much. It doesn't take a lot. But if you, if you consume it, you're not used to it, uh, it'll hit you hard. And so according to this information by the Antique Cannabis book, uh, if you get yourself some coffee, if you've gone too far, Drink your stuff, maybe get you a nice, stiff, what is that, a Cuban coffee like that. A, a shot of that Cuban coffee. Uh, some espresso. Uh, that'll, that'll level you right out. Uh, it must be assumed that such a warning label would uh, have, you, have you laughed out of the market. Uh, that business about antidote coffee after a number of people that die each year, zero, at morning, this is a poison. <laughs> I don't think they didn't even know what to do back then. So, um, also, you know, there's a number of other things that are rather interesting about the way they package this stuff. Uh, for instance, the color of the bottle. You know, studies conducted by major pharmaceutical houses in the early part of the 20th century showed that when exposed to air and sunlight, cannabis indica loses half of its medical strength every three years. Thus, in order to preserve the potency of their product, most pharmaceutical manufacturers began using dark colored bottles as protection against sunlight. Um, you know, and they talked about the way they manufactured it and what goes into it and the process. Um, and some of this stuff is rather humorous. Um, you know, I mentioned the thing about coffee. It says it cannot be emphasized enough that most of the early problems associated with cannabis and other botanical pharmaceuticals as well were caused by the variations in strength or potency between one batch and the next. Doesn't this sound a lot like medibles? Uh, someone rightfully described it as a pharmaceutical crapshoot. 
However, by the late 19th century, Park Davis, along with other pharmaceutical houses, started using physiological testing to assure consistency. So this is how they tested this stuff. Listen to this. Dogs would be given samples of the product as it was being manufactured and their bio signs monitored. Note, no dogs ever died as a result. <laughs> the makeup of the fluid extract, which was being manufactured in large beer vat like containers, see picture, uh, would then be adjusted accordingly. Only after a preset consistency could be assured did they begin to bottle the product. By 1928, when this bottle was made, they're talking about the Park Davis bottle, the famous one that's worth up to $5,000 if you can find one in pristine condition. Um, this bottle was made, the label was able to state average dose of fluid extract, one and a half minims, uh, which is 0.1 cc. Uh, such a statement made in the 1840s would not have been truthful, but by 1928, in the days of pharmaceutical crapshoot, were long over. Uh, this bottle uh, really does represent the height of pre-1940 cannabis technology. And then they go on into other details, you know, kind of boring stuff. This, the way it had to be sealed to keep the air out of it because, you know, there was a lot of information there about how, uh, how what kind of shelf life. They were learning about shelf life of products. And so by putting a manufacture date on there, they were implying that, hey, if you wait too long after, you, you know, this stuff's been made, it might lose its potency. They don't actually say that, but it's kind of implied. Uh, you know, you see an expiration date on any kind of, even over-the-counter, heck, for that matter, uh, vitamins. Uh, they put an expiration date on there. Um, but this was not common back then at all. They, nobody, nobody ever put an expiration date on anything. Uh, the cannabis tincture extracts. Uh, were the first thing that they would put a manufacture date on, which implied that, uh, hey, you kind of got to pay attention to when this was made or created because it, it may be different over time. So today we're talking about pre-prohibition cannabis as medicine, uh, the history of it in the Civil War, which, uh, you know, frankly is shocking. Uh, the way that they had to saw off limbs, uh, sometimes under just... Some booze. Here's some booze. We're taking off your leg. Shut up and bite this stick. It's a different day and age. More to come next on the Full Melt Show. Stand by. You're getting the Full Melt. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor. So nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit canalock.com to learn more about no smell technology. Hey, it's Steve Green. Make sure you make it out for the Big 420 celebration at the Sweet Leaf Patient Care Center in Flint. It's going to be a huge celebration from 11 to 7 Sunday and Monday. Holistic medicines and teas are just a part of it. There's massage, food, Honey and lavender healing products, local musicians and artists, workshops and seminars, vendors and people galore. It's the Sweet Leaf Patient Care Collective, 400 South Door Highway, Flint, Sunday and Monday. That's this Sunday and Monday from 11 to 7 for 420. Don't miss it. Imagine a world where patients can use marijuana like any other medicine. The Marijuana Patients Organization challenges the status quo by helping our neighbors to enjoy a better quality of life. Visit the MPO at MarijuanaPatients.org and enjoy informative articles, engaging debates, and information about treatments, doctors, and dispensaries in your area. Over 50,000 people have registered at MarijuanaPatients.org since 2010. Join us at the Marijuana Patients Organization today. MarijuanaPatients.org. It started with Weed 1. Some have called it a watershed moment. Then came Weed 2. It's absurd that we would have to do this to get medicine. Now Dr. Sanjay Gupta is at it again, and he's reaching higher than ever with Weed 3. I never thought I would be smoking weed in the hospital. The movement behind it. We demand this plant go through the process of the FDA. The radical research. I have to say I'm kind of stunned. Weed 3, the marijuana revolution. All new Sunday, April 19th at 9. They're parasites. They've got no contribution to this society. They're preying on our community and our kids. And it's going to end bad. We've got exactly $100,000 in cash in the back of this car. I bet there's guys right there in that prison for doing just what we're about to do. I want the 
the Breckenridge Cannabis Club to be a household name. This is us pioneering a new industry. He's going after every resort town in Colorado. His plan is brilliant. This is a big boy operation now. We are not the Amsterdam or the Rockies. We're Breckenridge. Absolutely unbelievable to us that this has happened so quickly. That's when the town erupted. All hell can break loose. I think we have an image to protect. The powerful Mm -hmm. elite has definitely put the pressure on. Everyone is playing everyone. They're going to have a target painted on their back. That is a real threat. There's $2 billion to be had next year. I plan to take more than my fair share. High Profits. Season premieres Sunday night at 10 Eastern on CNN. It's the Full Melt Radio Show. Radio Show. So we've been talking about uh, pre-prohibition cannabis and what that looked like. We found out that it wasn't really used on the battlefield in the Civil War. It didn't make it out there, even though it was being used as a medicine elsewhere in this country. And um, later, after the Civil War, was uh, commonly manufactured by uh, some of the mar- pharmaceutical companies that are still in existence today. Uh, lucky to have with, enough with us on the phone, uh, Mr. Chuck Ream, who's a bit of a historian on this uh, subject himself. Uh, Chuck, welcome to the program. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um we were talking about, uh, you know, what these medicine bottles were, what they looked like. Uh, I know you're a bit of a buff on this. Can you tell us what you yeah. know about cannabis as medicine before 1940 when uh, really this kind of got taken out of everything? Okay, yeah. I've got a funny story about the bottles. So I tried, I tried on the web to find the bottles and uh, even uh, bottles that have been modern made in modern glass to look like the ancient bottles. I can't even find them. But, uh, yeah, Eli Lilly or Squibb or Merck, they all made uh, tincture of cannabis, which was a very, very common medication. Uh, it was used in India for centuries, and this English guy who was the director of their railroads, Dr. William O'Shaughnessy, who was also a medical doctor, saw this being used to treat things that were very difficult, like like tetanus and lockjaw and rabies and uh, and uh, he, he uh, started to investigate and realized for things like seizure it was astounding it just worked where nothing else did so he brought it back first to England and Europe and then it migrated to America and since they had very few good uh, medications it became extraordinarily popular in the in the U S. Uh, especially in the uh, 60s, uh, 1860s, uh, 1870s. In the 1860s, there was a medical paper written by the Ohio uh, uh, Physician Society that listed more than 100 uses for cannabis medications. That was 1860. Um, So it got got bigger and bigger, uh, probably up to about the turn of the century. Cannabis treats so many things, you know how effective it could be when they didn't really have much else to use. One funny story is that the ladies' tonic would contain um, opium, cocaine, and cannabis. And so the the ladies would go out to protest demon rum, and they would go out and scream about John Barleycorn and uh, how it was destroying the moral fabric of the universe. And they would come home and very primly have a half a teaspoon of ladies' tonic, <laughs> which would be it should be cocaine, morphine, and cannabis. So, uh, yeah, it got really big in the 20s. In the 1920s in the U.S., you could go into a wholesale house, a pharmacy wholesale house, uh, or in the teen, I guess this was, and buy a quart jar of the extract which would have like 4,000 doses uh, in it. You know, really extracted uh, a lot and sitting right there for anyone to pick up and no one you uh, <clears throat> abused it. And the strange thing, Steve, is the strangest thing, just think about this, nobody for 100 years made any comment that it got you high. <laughs> and they simply... They simply accepted it. They simply accepted the fact that a medication might make you feel somewhat different. And it felt good, so they didn't complain about it. And uh, 
So here we're having this big problem about medical marijuana and about it, how it might get you high. And our ancestors were so much tougher than us that they never even mentioned it. It never even came up. Uh, they had that mama's little helper there, though, didn't they? It was mama's little helper, but it was a, well, they had the real mama's little helper with the hard drugs. <laughs> Cannabis could be a minor um, helper, but they had Americans in the uh, 1880s, 1890s had the full range of anything that they wanted to use. And here's another great one that I love, Steve. There were places in the 1890s where uh, cigarettes and alcohol were totally illegal and uh, morphine base and cocaine were fully legal. So it just depends on the social mores and who's in charge and there's no real uh, inherent danger from these drugs. The drugs is from the people who use them wrong. But we know that. Social control uh, is what the whole war on drugs has always been about, isn't it, Chuck? It's always been about social control and, and rooted in bigotry, hatred. That's my thesis. That's, uh, that is, I, I wrote my whole manuscript, 170,000 words. And never polished it any or got enough idea published. But I spent 30 years reading books on why are they doing this. I honestly, God, I just couldn't understand how you could possibly make cannabis illegal. And so I read uh, so many books. And yes, it's social control. It is a it is a cultural war for social control. Um, and and the, and the thesis goes like this: If you remember the 60s. The American public was existentially terrified, terrified about their very existence in relation to the cities burning down, blacks are burning down all the cities, and the hippies are undermining the very fundamentals of our culture with all their sex and drugs, blah, blah, permissiveness, and blah, blah, blah. The hippies were viewed as a threat to people like the Nixon administration, weren't they? Or the Nixon administration could use it as a perceived threat to put together their silent majority. Ah, so and, so uh, sell you have, sell you the problem and then sell you the we, cure. Nixon's aide Ehrlichman, Ehrlichman said, "We know darn well this drug problem is not as serious as we make it out to be, but there are just too many political points here to pass up." <laughs> look it up on the web. Look up Ehrlichman's statement, and then look up Nixon's statement, which said. Uh, Nixon said, uh, well, we all know that the whole problem is really the blacks. Okay? Nixon's actually on his tapes. This was on his tapes. He said, we all know the whole problem is really the blacks. We have to figure out a policy that recognizes this without appearing to. Well, there, it says it all right there, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then Ehrlichman says, uh, well, this problem is not really so bad, but boy, we sure used it for all it was worth. So they started, anyway, they started the drug war because they could whip up this fear, and the fear was real, too. Fear of hippies, fear of blacks. And they had a drug war. They really put seven times as many people in prison now. They, we have a huge, we've transferred from college to, our money from college to prison. And uh, the thing of it is, Steve, it has worked. It has worked very well. People say the drug war hasn't worked. Well, it hasn't worked only in terms of its stated objectives. Only the, here's the, I, it, the irony of this. It, it has worked perfectly. In terms, there's no American anymore who has tremendous fear of hippies or thinks the blacks are going to burn <laughs> down the cities. Uh, there's a this tremendous irony. Yeah, it did work. Uh, there's this huge irony in the idea that uh, pre-drug enforcement administration, which wasn't existed, it didn't exist at the time uh, that I'm referring to during the Nixon administration, uh, the president famously gave Elvis existed, existed. Well, pre- there was something that pre-existed it, but uh, he famously gave yeah. Elvis a badge, a, a like an FBI badge. Um, and it was all about drugs. Yeah. He's, control the drugs. And uh, I'm mean, with you on the drug thing, you know. And uh, even Elvis kind of looked at the hippies as weirdos, kind of strange ones. And uh, But then Elvis? to Elvis. Uh, but then to have Elvis yeah. uh, die on a, uh, you know, on the toilet with uh, some, uh, you know, uh, full of drugs uh, is kind of ironic. Oh, yeah. It was 
extraordinarily ironic. Elvis pumped every sort of upper and downer uh, into him that he could find, and then he was very self-righteous about drugs, quote-unquote. And he petitioned Nixon. His people asked Nixon if he could please come in and get a badge to be a drug uh, uh, a drug warrior, like drugs. Chuck, we've we've yeah. reached we've reached the end of our program, and uh, you've entertained us uh, tremendously with uh, your historical knowledge of this subject. Thank you for coming on the program today. All right, thanks for inviting me. Take care now. You you indeed too. Uh, listen, we've run out of time today. We're up against the clock. We'll see you next time for the next episode of the Full Melt Show. The Full Melt Show is a production of TFM Media.